This demo will show you how to use RSM and these new HPC parametric packs to set up your solve simultaneously and for a fraction of the price. Until ANSYS 14.0, design points had to be solved sequentially. So you'd set up your workbench system, you go to hit solve, and it would solve the first design point, then the second design point, then the third design point, and so on. Within each design point, you could have parallel runs with RSM, but you couldn't solve the entire design point series in parallel. Potentially running hundreds of long-running design points, this could be time prohibitive. So a simultaneous design point update is where you start with a system like this, you pass it off to RSM, and then RSM kicks off a number of simultaneous jobs. With several design points running simultaneously, the time to overall results is greatly reduced. However, ANSYS products grab a license at each, as each software component is executed. So in order to update end design points simultaneously, you need n times the licenses, and that can start to get expensive. It can also make the design points prone to failure if there are not enough licenses available. So ANSYS brings out these new ANSYS HPC parametric packs. This is just starting now at 14.5. They allow users to run n design points simultaneously, amplifying your base license set. So however many base licenses you have in your reserve license set can be amplified by these. It doesn't work with all keys, but it works with most keys at ANSYS, especially all of the recent products. It's scalable, similar to the ANSYS HPC packs. So if you buy one pack, it scales four ways. If you buy two packs, well, it still looks linear there, but by the time you get to three, you can see 16, four goes up to 32 way, and five goes up to 64 way. So if you buy five of these packs, and you have one set of licenses, you know, mechanical key, fluent key, HPC pack, you know, a few other keys like that, it will amplify all of those types of keys up 64 times with only five of these packs. And you'll be able to run 64 parallel runs across your network. This technology is enabled by ANSYS Workbench, grouping all these things together and, and managing the parameters and the design points. It needs to be done through design point updates. You need to have reserve licensing in place, and it has to execute through the RSM. So here's a simple one-way FSI project that we're going to run this test through. Just to pop in and show you what the geometry looks like. You can see it's just a thin model airfoil on a post there. Let's take a quick look at the mesh. So here's the mesh. Uh, it's set up with just a basic automatic setup. There's some name selections with inflation in there so it can figure out what to do. Let's just generate the mesh. I'll roll the model around. You can see how it generated these prism layers and uh, all that sort of thing. You can see those prism layers there. All right, so the model is good. Uh, we could check quality. We could output quality. You can adjust parameters in here. Uh, setting up parameters is as simple as, as scrolling down and checking things like this relevance button would create a parameter for the mesh size. So if you wanted to do a mesh refinement study, you could parameterize that, or various sizings and different things like that. So very easy to set all that up. I'm going to close this. Similarly, you could set up the CFX setup. You could parameterize things in there, like velocity, magnitude, those sorts of things. Then that gets sent over to the structural. If we go in here and look at the structural data, now Workbench is smart enough that it knew to bring only the solid portions of the geometry over into here to mechanical. Maybe we can take a look at this mesh as well, update the mesh. So here's our mesh that it generated automatically again. And again, we have the option if we wanted to to go in and adjust the settings that generated this mesh. Uh, you'll notice also that the load was imported automatically. Now all I need to do to get this to solve is to update the whole process. So let's hit update project. And see right now it's updating the setup component in fluid flow CFX. And you can see the little checkbox after that's updated. And now it's running the solver. It's launching the solver. You can see this has now got the lightning bolt. And it's just going to basically step its way through the whole process. So what we have here is a parametric process, meaning I can adjust uh, inputs parametrically. It's persistent, meaning when I make an update, those updates are propagated throughout the model. And it's automated, meaning that as it goes through, it knows how to set up prism, and it knows how to break up the geometry to send the fluids to the one side, the geometry to the other. It knows how to apply the solution from this one to this one very easily. All the files are managed in the background. It's great. It looks after all of that for me. Now, it does take a few minutes to run through the solve, so I will skip some time. Oh, you can see the solution's done now. It's, it's uh, able to map that solution over here to this setup, but first it's checking out these results. It's finalizing the results component of this system. And in there, we could have it put out other output parameters. Right now, we don't have any coming out of there, but we could have. Now it's over here updating the setup in static structural. And now it's finalizing that side of things. 
So now if we wanted to take a look at those results, I can just click on this and bring up the results. And here's our solution. And you can look at the deformation, things like this. We can make these little movies. So pretty nice and easy. But the main thing we're after here is the force reactions. In this case, we're looking at the force reaction in this direction. And the force reaction is 615 newtons. And maybe we want this to be sized exactly the right radius to give us 600 newtons at this particular speed. Now we could also parameterize the speed, but just to keep it simple, because we're mainly focusing here on how to set up RSM. That's our problem. So the first thing you want to do when you set up for the parametric packs and running these design points is you have to turn off the solution process. You have to say run in foreground here, because we're going to use RSM on the whole design point, not just a single system or component of it. So we can check that. We can see that this uses the multi-physics license for the fluid flow and uh, the multi-physics license for the static structural. And for the static structural solver, we also need to make sure that we're using application default, not remote, not submit to remote solve manager, because we're going to be applying that at the higher level. So now we're ready to set up RSM. Left click on the parameter set. And you see up here, the first option is update option to run in foreground. Since we've set each system to run in foreground, we can now set the entire design point to submit to Remote Solve Manager. And this gives us a variety of options. The first one is License Checkout On Demand. We're going to use the reserve set of licenses. When you use HPC packs, you have to reserve your keys. I'm going to click on Select Licenses, and this window pops up. I work at ANSYS, so I've got pretty much 10 of everything. Uh, you won't have this many. Instead, you'll see the licenses that you actually have available in your license set. Even then, it might be a bit much. If you go and click on Use Licenses, it tells you what licenses were actually used last time the project was run. And you can see also that it tells you what system each license was used and where. So it's saying that ANSYS Multiphysics was used for B5, C5, and C6. For this solution, for this solution, and for this setup. So it went and chose Multiphysics for my fluid flow. It makes the decision of which license to go with based on the license settings. If you bring up the License Admin Utility, and you set license preferences, you can see here the order that we in, in which the licenses will be picked up. And because ANSYS Multiphysics was at the top of my list, it was the one picked up first. If I had wanted to, I could have had something like a ANSYS CFD key at the top of my list. So now ANSYS CFD is above Multiphysics. And if I'd run this again, it, it would probably have chosen that key. But as it was, it chose ANSYS Multiphysics. I can click Add and add that to the list of reserved licenses. The NECFX module we don't really need. Design model we definitely need, so we'll click Add on that. Brings that one over. ISM CFD. In this case, in that previous list, ISM CFD must have been higher on the list than ANSYS Meshing. I don't want ISM CFD in this case. I just want the ANSYS Meshing key for two reasons. One, it really is just using ANSYS Meshing. And also, ISM CFD doesn't have a little asterisk next to it indicating that it's not amplified by the HPC parametric packs. So I can look under my available licenses. I can look under prep post to filter this down a bit. And I'm going to go down to ANSYS meshing, which has an asterisk. I'm also going to want to add an HPC key for those HPC packs. That will let my CFX solve in parallel with my HPC pack. Now what we're here to talk about is these HPC parametric packs. So watch what happens. I've got these list of keys. These are the reserved keys, the ones I can use at once. When I add this HPC pack, it amplifies everything else. So here's my one HPC parametric pack, and you can see that it amplified my HPC pack by four, my meshing by four, and my multiphysics by four. Could not amplify my design modeler key because of the parasolid component in there. We can't amplify licenses that came from another company. That is, you'd have the same problem if you had a Pro-E reader or other keys like that. If I had another HPC pack, See, it goes up to 8, 16, 32, 64, and you can't add more than five packs. So let's remove those down again. Just have one. So that's the basic setup. It amplifies all the keys that have a little asterisk on them. It doesn't multiply academic keys, and it doesn't amplify some of the older keys, but it does amplify all the newer keys, with a few exceptions. Other things to look at, you can do each component. In this case, I'm going to choose parallel mode for each component. And I'm going to let each one use two CPUs, because down here where it says job submission, instead of one job for all design points or one job for each design point, I'm going to specify the maximum number of jobs and set that to four to match my number of HPC parametric packs. So I've got four jobs, each running two-way parallel for each system. That's going to chew up all eight of my CPUs 
and that's all I have. If I wanted to, I could set up the local host as a, you know different machines, maybe a, a number of different machines, or I could also set up a number of different queues. I could have a priority queue. I could have a you know when you have time for it queue, and I could have these different queues and choose which queue I want this job to run through. A pre-RSM foreground update. It's going to update the geometry up front because we can't amplify that parasolid kernel. So you'll see it go through all the geometry updates for each set of points that it collects, and then it'll send those off and get them solved. Update design points in order. That makes a big difference if you've got a combination of geometry parameters and other parameters. All right, so that's everything there set up. I can now go and actually create a list of design points. If I click down here on parameter set, you can see here's my one parameter. I could start just typing numbers in here, maybe 225. 235. And I could come up with a list of parameters like this. You need a list in this table in order for it to solve. And you can type them out manually. Or I could generate the list using one of the Design Explorer tools. So that's what I'm going to do. Return to project. And I'm going to drag and drop one of these systems over. Since this is really only one parameter and it's going to form a curve and it would pick the best point along the curve, the response surface optimization is probably the fastest way to go, but since it's 14.5 and we've got this new direct optimization option, I'm going to go with that. It adds a little more accuracy because you're not relying on an interpolated curve. So we'll go into the direct optimization system. You can see here a summary of the settings. We can actually go inside the system to help set it up better. And first you pick the optimization type. I'm going to choose adaptive single objective, but we, you can see we have a variety of other options. Number of initial samples. I'm going to set that to something higher. Uh, since we have four parametric packs, I'm just going to go with a number like eight, so you can see it solve each one twice. Number of screening samples, this happens on the response surface, so I'm going to go with 100, that's fine, that'll be just a couple seconds. Maximum number of evaluations, how many actual solves is it going to run? Let's go with something like 24, just so that we have three sets at most. There's other ways to constrain how this algorithm works. There's also an option for number of retries. If a design point were to fail, you could say that you wanted to try a couple more times something like that. Now for setting the actual objectives and constraints, you click up here and this optimization option appears and you can select which parameter you want to look at. I'm going to look at force reaction and for my objective I'm going to set seek target. The target will be 600 and that goal is summarized over here. Next I'm going to click on the range. It's by default giving me a plus or minus 10% we know that the output's already above 600. Reducing the radius will get us to drop down closer towards 600. So we can assume that we should, we should start this at a max of 250. We could go down to 225 and see if that range works out for us. We're now ready. You've got the lightning bolt on the optimization. You can see here a summary of what the goals are, what this method is, configuration, what this current status is. Now, I'm going to hit update just to show you what happens. but. Ta-da! Error message. RSM needs to bundle up this project and hand it off to remote machines. And in order to do that, it expects a full set of saved files. So RSM always insists that you save before running. So I'm going to hit OK. Save the project. That's all you got to do. And then we can update. So it builds that first list of eight samples that are going to be in the Latin hypercube. Once these are solved, it start uh, populating this chart and you'll see it update. Let's go to click on Show Progress. So what you'll see is that it has to go and refresh the components for each of these design points. It's not actually generating the mesh right now, it's just setting up the component. It will have to generate the geometry in advance, and you'll see it will do all these things before it gets going to RSM. So through the magic of movie making, again, we'll skip some time. Alright, so now it's finished that action, it's starting to submit the jobs to RSM. You can see it's bundled up jobs 1 and 2 together, jobs 3 and 4 together, and so on. So let's bring up RSM. So this little window over here would start automatically. It'll just sit and run off in the corner. But you can also bring up this interactive window. Uh, that is also very helpful. Here's where I would set up my compute servers if I had a number of distributed machines. And you can see for each one, I can set up the number of jobs. RSM works in jobs, not in cores like some of the other LMS or other types of, of servers work, although it does work with those, and those can break these jobs up into cores. And you can set up all this stuff ahead of time. There's an RSM wizard to help you get the job done. After you set up a number of these, you can also set up a number of different queues. You can add a queue. So for instance, I could call this a priority queue and give it the name priority. And then when the priority is high, 
And then when I had chosen the queues before, instead of just choosing my local queue, I could have chosen this new priority queue. And then that would have given me priority over others in my company who were running on the RSM as well. So there's all different ways you can set this up. There's nothing running on the priority queue, but on the local queue, I have all of these things running. One and two, three and four, five and six, seven and eight. If I click on one of these, it gives the details of what's going on. What happened at what time? I can scroll down and look in and see that it's inquiring files. If something were to go wrong, if a license server failed or something like that, you'll see those sorts of messages will be in here as well. And it's going to run through and just crank its way through the, these eight. If you want to monitor this in other ways, you can also bring up the task manager. The main workbench window is ANSYS Framework Workbench, this FWW. You can also find some other ones down here. Here's framework.executable, framework.exe, framework.exe. These are the four jobs that are running in the queue. You can look at the performance this way as well and see that everything's fully tasked right now. So then you go, you get yourself a coffee, that sort of thing, and through the magic of movie making again, we'll, we'll speed this all up. You can see here that this objectives and constraints has started to light up. And we can click on that and see the updating chart here. You can see the target value that it's trying to target, and it's trying to find its way back to that. Here is the uh, parameter. It hasn't done a zoom in yet. So the data here is converged. It's putting in the new data points. There's some uh, new candidate points and so on. So here's a new verification point that it's going to try to run. Again, it's using RSM even though there's only one point. When that point is completed, then it will uh, Eva evaluate that point and then create a new set and so on. So it's moving right along. You can see it's converged down another set here. So we'd set a max number of points to 24. So it's running through its last set. There's only three in this set. From the job status, you can see which ones are still running. These last three, and they each have one design point each. But if we do a quick review of what's been done already, in the beginning we had eight design points kicked off, so each one had to be completed successfully finish successfully, 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 all the way down. And then we had the second set that started. And now the second set didn't need to run as many design points because of the way that the algorithm works. So it was able to just do it with a very few like this. And then there was a few more. And then there, maybe there was one that had five. So the first one had two design points, and the rest only had uh, one each. You see how the jobs get divided up. And then there was a couple that just ran one at a time because it was only just checking something out and then it decided that it needed to run a few more and so on. So now we're down to the last three. Final design points are coming in. And it's done. So here's our, our zoom in on the final convergence. Here's our plot in this direction. You can look at candidate points. See where the candidates are, variation. We can compare different points. Uh, we can look at the trade-off. You can see here, these are the far-flung points as it zoomed in on this is the optimum right at 600. It's not quite a linear relationship in here. You can look at design samples. You can move this to eliminate samples and so on. Now you can see the samples that, that we like. Sample 23 turned out to be the best, of course, near the end. You can also look at the full table of raw optimization data. If you wanted to, you can right-click and export this data to Excel and do other things with it there. All right, thank you very much.